what we're going to try to do is share some of the experiences that we've had, that Mark and I have had, in dealing with AST issues as they have arisen. Um, we uh, also want to encourage you to participate with the environmental committees, uh, which we are associated with, with the West Virginia Oil and Natural Gas Association, the Independent Oil and Gas Association, and the West Virginia Manufacturers Association. Um, all of whom are actively following this and very involved in helping to develop the AST program. Uh, Mike Zito is the chair for Wavanga, Doug Malcolm for IOGA, and uh, J.B. Turley heads up the water team for the WVMA. Uh, we'd be happy to provide you their contact information if you would like to have that. Uh, we said in the invitation that we would be talking about any legislation that was introduced. To our knowledge, no legislation dealing with above ground storage tanks has been introduced in this session. Therefore, you, we will not be reporting on that today. As April told you, we'll stay on after we're done here to answer questions, or, or you can contact us using the information on your screen if you have additional questions or experience, questions to ask us or experiences that you would like to share. With that, I will turn it over to the fellow who probably knows more about uh, the act uh, in the state um, than any other uh, lawyer, at least anybody outside the DEP, Mark Clark. Thank you, Dave. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So I will get right into our uh, information for today. Last week, um, IOGA was able to obtain, through a FOIA request, the list of regulated tanks, essentially all level one, level two tanks, and that totaled just over 8,000 regulated tanks, right about 8,038. Um, of those, they're not really broken down, it was just a complete dump. Um, we've determined that almost half of those, around 3,800, are oil and gas industry type tanks. Um, that breakdown there is about 1,200 in the Z level one ZCC, and about 2,500 in level two ZPC. Uh, this number is down from a previous estimate that we had of 11,500 regulated tanks. Um, so we do think that uh, a number of tank owners are closing or moving tanks out of the ZCC, ZPC, uh, or ch changing their function from a storage tank to a process vessel. Uh, again, to get them out of the definition of AST. A significant reduction in the number of, of regulated tanks, and uh, sounds like people are doing good work to minimize their regulatory uh, burden with this tank act and rule. We talked last time in October, I believe, about tank closure and, and requirements related to that uh, briefly the requirements for closure of above ground tanks and remediation as a result of relief or release from a tank is found in the Act at 2230 uh, Section 5. And a release is defined to include uh, any fluids making it to the waters of the state or escaping from secondary containment. So closure requirements, um, permanent closure requirements would relate to a tank that's empty, cleaned of materials and residue, and rendered incapable of holding fluid. Those uh, regulatory requirements are set out at 47 CSR section 63-11.3. Previously, and I think we reported this last time, the West Virginia DEP's view was that any relocation required the use of the closure procedure which is overseen, which was overseen by the Office of Environmental Remediation. Uh, we've had discussions and, and perhaps back, a little back and forth regarding the need for that, and in large part because the, one of the objectives of the Act is to um, reduce the exposure of waters of the state to contaminants. So we suggested that having a simpler approach and a cheaper approach to removing tanks from the uh, level one, level two categories would be more appropriate, more consistent with the uh, goals of the act. So just recently, the, the uh, DEP has indicated that they're taking 
a bit of a different approach, a more flexible approach, so that now if you're relocating a tank, uh, that is to an, a, another site for use or to a storage location, your, um, your office, for example, you can move the tank without going through the prior uh, closing plan and approval and then the resulting uh, closing report that would follow that. What you have to do is do a change in registration of information, which you would normally have to do, and um, perform some limited site sampling based on the contents. The suggestion was at least a couple of different locations. This is this is the flexible and and sort of work in prog progress part of this that um, a couple of samples, one underneath the tank, one at the uh, at any outlet would be appropriate and designed around what's in the tank. While this may not be uh, technically required under the rules or the act, um, the Groundwater Protection Act may also apply as well, and so this may be a, a, a sort of an informal compromise approach to getting tanks outside of regulated categories and into the um, and into a non-regulated registered label only category. And Dave Yossi has a, a contribution on that. Well, yeah, just. To add, the mere fact that there are substances within secondary containment does not mean that there was a release if it didn't go down to groundwater or didn't go outside the secondary containment. And that would affect what you would do as far as any kind of uh, corrective action that would be required. So as Mark said, there's a lot of flexibility there and people should evaluate according to their own particular circumstances. Exactly. That you know, leads to the, the end. If you and, that, and that's the reason for the flexible approach. Um, DEP doesn't seem to want to try to designate a one-size-fits-all here, but rather uh, identify what needs to be done in a particular circumstance to make sure that uh, waters of the state are protected. So any kind of corrective action may not be needed at all. So DEP inspections have been uh, continuing, uh, as many of you know, and have been visited by inspectors. Uh, I've just recently reviewed um, an additional 40 or so uh, inspection reports, and the notices of violations are, are fairly routine. Um, they've been uh, assessed against um, county and municipal government agencies, as well as uh, industrial operators. Generally, you'll have an opportunity to fix, abate the, uh, the notice of violation, and that's, I think, been pretty effective and working for almost everybody. Um, there have been some instances where there have been civil administrative penalties proposed. Um, those, it's our understanding, those situations are limited to um, situations where a spill had occurred or some other release that uh, generated um, an inspection. The uh, any, well, for example, inspections resulting from a spill uh, that discovered an unregistered uh, non-level one or level two tank received NOVs for failure to register and failure to report the spill, and then was referred to enforcement, at least at, as indicated on the form. So that, uh, that's a situation where you're going to um, need to be particularly responsive and, and cooperative. Another example um, where we had a spill and a number of notices of violation, uh, a penalty was, was proposed. It, the notices of violation in, included failure to notify the county emergency management of a release under section 6.2a of the uh, rule, failure to notify water system of municipal emergency response, which is actually under the act, section 10a of the act, 
failure to have closure activities performed by a PE, and failure to label uh, or provide signage. That, uh, which is under Section 5.6 of the rule, the proposed penalties for all those totaled over $10,000. So the amounts can be significant. And obviously, you want to minimize those activities. I think if you, uh, if you receive a notice of violation and address it promptly and uh, fully, you'll be able to, uh, at least so far, have been able to stay away from penalty uh, or consent orders. Had a question come in asking about whether is sampling required prior to the activity or after tank and site have been reclaimed. The sampling uh, referred to, as we understand it, is once you move a tank, you still have to sample the soil underneath where it was. So you're taking a couple of samples, soil samples, related to where the tank was uh, and no reclamation may, may be needed. Uh, I guess part of the question is, can you reclaim the site? And um, I wouldn't envision if you're relocating, you're necessarily reclaiming the site. But that uh, may be a, a concern for the DEP if you push a bunch of dirt around uh, and then try to sample after that. I think your sampling would need to be right after the tank is uh, relocated. Go ahead and um, any follow-up questions to that, uh, please submit if I fail to answer it. So just to go over the uh, types of violations that we're seeing, it's really uh, pretty much the same as what we've seen and reported on in the last uh, webinar. Uh, registration and fees, anybody who has failed to pay their uh, fees is subject to an NOV. Signage labeling is important. Um, ensure that ASTs have secondary containment. Uh, David will be talking a little bit about that and that uh, the secondary containment update or upgrading uh, dates have passed. Performing visual inspection on a 14-day for level one and monthly for level two, um, and having that um, the record keeping to support that is is going to be necessary for you to uh, receive a clean bill of health. SPR plan or a substitute, whether it's none or inadequate, it will receive an NOV, and then we've mentioned notice of notice to public water system and county emergency response organizations in the event of a spill, oh, I'm sorry, that's required under the Act and then notice of emergency response entities as well as reporting to the spill uh, hotline in the event of a confirmed release. And then closure not performed by RPE. The, just note for you, the fees, um, we were, I also mentioned that there were NOVs for failure to pay, uh, but the invoices that went out in October also included um, a $30 fee that we were not anticipating for um, Protect Our Water Fund. So that fund is uh, statutorily required, but it's also limited to a million dollar uh, targeted cap that uh, the DEP can supplement as necessary to maintain that million dollars. So they did uh, bill each tank $30 uh, for that fund, and we don't really have more information right now on where all those resources are going or whether they're being used for spills or not. Um, just to go over a little bit of a reminder for deadlines, the, the deadlines that have passed, uh, secondary containment just mentioned, which were was November 1st of 2016 and February 1st, 2017. Uh, level one tanks were supposed to have normal and emergency vents uh, upgraded by December 31st, 2016. And then your fit for service certification uh, was due by January 28th, 2017.
the upcoming dates, which are primarily June 30th of this year, uh, require upgrades for cathodic protection, or level one upgrades for cathodic protection or exterior coatings or interior, internal linings, and then overfill and spill prevention and leak detection if it's other than visual, which if you, had, if you were doing visual inspection for leak detection, then that needed to start uh, August 1st of 2016. Then uh, also on June 30th is level two tanks are required to have their normal and emergency vent vents in place at that time. Um, the next deadline after that is December 31st, and that's where level two tanks uh, pretty much need to conform to most all the other requirements that level one have already had to achieve as of June 30th. Have another question. Um, asking whether there's a form for the 14-day and monthly inspections. And I am not aware of any form that the DEP has uh, re certainly not required or even proposed. So essentially, uh, individual companies are coming up with a form that works for their, their operations. Um, and generally, as long as you have something in writing that looks like you're keeping up with the inspection requirements, I think those have been sufficient for the most part. And another question on whether the $30 uh, Protect Our Water Fund fee is for level, whether that's only for level one and level two tanks and not other tanks that are registered. And I believe that's the case. I think only registered tanks um, were receiving the Protect Our Water Fund fee. The, the Label and uh, register and label only tanks are not um, subject to any of the fees. And we are loving this. The questions are coming in. Can you provide the updates currently being discussed in writing? Sure. We uh, we have a little two-page overview of the uh, deadlines, and uh, we can send that out to the working group. I believe we went over those, may have provided them uh, last October, but we'll just go ahead and send them out to everybody uh, for your ease of reference. Mr. Clark, there may be another question. Oh, okay. Do you want to Before I... Uh, next question is, I've heard that there's a potential bill to exempt oil and level, oil and gas level two tanks that are 210 barrel or less. Um, I believe that has been discussed um, and is perhaps in the drafting stage, but to my knowledge, as of Tuesday, that bill, no bill like that has been introduced at the legislature. But I think it is uh, certainly a, an objective of IOGA and supported by Wabonga as well to uh, get some relief for the level two tanks that are more than five hours upstream for many uh, water supply. And with that, I will turn things back to Mr. Yossi. Thanks, Mark. When we last talked, we had been told that any change to one of the plans that is required in an NPDES permit, such as a groundwater protection plan, a stormwater pollution prevention plan, or a spill um, prevention response plan, when, when the, any of those plans were changed, the NPDES permit would have to be modified. Um, we have since learned the DEP is not taking that position, and therefore you can make those changes freely without having to change the NPDES permit. That won't have um, much application for oil and gas ASC owners since they are not usually operating under NPDES permits, but for manufacturers and for others it's going to be a tremendous um, relief from the burden of having to go through permit modification in order to make small changes in those plans. Those plans will still need approval, but the permits will not be subject to, to modification. 
As Mark said, uh, we've had a number of questions about secondary containment uh, found in Section 10 of the regulations. Uh, three months after the effective date of the, of the rule, August 1st, 2016, um, was the date for Level 1 tanks to be in compliance with secondary containment, February 1st, um, 2017, for Level 2, which was six months after the um, adoption of the regulations, or the effective date of the regulations. Um, those have some of the shortest compliance deadlines because the DEP took the position that secondary containment had already been required under the Groundwater Protection Act. Um, be that as it may, many sites will not have, did not have, um, secondary containment that was in place at the time those deadlines uh, came and passed. For those who have tanks that do not have sufficient secondary containment around them, a compliance schedule may be available uh, in which you would identify the reasonable time frames for getting secondary containment in place. Uh, as our understanding, the DEP has been very good about um, negotiating and, and talking with people and coming up with reasonable plans for getting that in place given capital budget, budgets and the like. I have seen at least one draft plan that had stipulated penalties if the, if the party failed to meet the deadlines for having secondary containment in place. Um, not sure that that is necessarily required. It's not required by the AST Act, and I question whether that is something that really is needed unless there's been some demonstration that, that compliance deadlines aren't going to be met for some reason. So if you get that kind of compliance plan, you might want to uh, consider um, pushing back as far as any kind of stipulated penalties. But Overall, keep in mind that compliance schedules, consent orders, and the like um, are a useful means of coming into compliance while you're putting together secondary containment. Uh, one other issue we've had with regard to secondary containment is the question of whether drainage systems that can capture the contents of the AST and take it to some kind of holding area are acceptable, and they are. Uh, the DEP has confirmed that where we have had a, a, some questions from the DEP is whether inspections are required of the drainage lines that take um, take the, uh, oh, for example, an AST back down to a wastewater treatment plant or a holding pond. And of course, when those lines are underground, it's impossible to inspect them every 14 days or every month as you would if you have a dike around secondary containment. You can easily visually identify any problems with the dike. Um, is my understanding, and just based on hearsay, that the DEP may be willing to reconsider that and allow use of those kind of drainage systems without um, uh, every 14 days or every month having to inspect them, which would, of course, make them Im almost impossible to use. Uh, and we will um, we'll, we'll continue to, to report on that as we hear what position the DEP is taking. Um, question here, have you heard of any consent orders being signed by the DEP to bring tanks into compliance? If so, can you comment on any of the agreements in the orders? I have only seen one draft, it's not a final, and that was the one that contained the, the uh, stipulated penalties I was just referring to. If anybody has those, has um, a draft of an order and would like to have us share it, we could share it anonymously, we'd be happy to let people to share that and let the folks on this call know what kinds of things are going into the consent orders. I feel guilty even offering this slide. We, uh, with corrosion and deterioration prevention, um, we have heard some talk that some of the corrosion, and the, uh, the cathodic protection may be causing more problems than it's solving with regard to above ground storage tanks. And I have nothing more to report on that, but would invite anybody to comment on it if that is a situation that they've been seeing. Tanks temporarily out of service. This is a category that doesn't exist. It was dropped during negotiations over the rule because at that time in the rule, the, the standards that applied to tanks that were out of service were the same as those that applied to tanks were in service, so there was no advantage to them. Right now we have tanks that are either empty and closed or they're active. My question to the folks on this call is, is there any interest in seeking guidance that would allow us to have a temporarily out-of-service category where the, the standards weren't set at the same level as active tanks, they'd have to be empty, 
um, but that they could be kept empty without inspections and all until such time as they were brought back into service, at which time they would presumably have to be inspected again in order to be put back into service. Um, any help if you would, this is a, one of those areas where if you would talk to your association environmental committee heads and uh, indicate some interest, I think that would be welcome. Alternative standards. One of the greatest areas of dispute in the course of negotiating the AST Act was the question of whether folks who couldn't comply with certain industry standards could propose an alternative. And eventually in the Act we got to the place where uh, we agreed, we compromised, um, and if you can provide a, a protection, a, a tank standard that is that is protective of waters of the state, that is something you can do in lieu of the regulations uh, established by the DEP. The test is not whether they're equivalent to the DEP's standards, it's whether they protect waters of the state. The uh, alternative standards are completely at the discretion of the DEP, and as you can see in the quoted language there, uh, so long as, in the opinion of the Secretary, they're sufficient in combination with practices and protections already in place to protect waters of the state. Many people that we've run into with issues uh, um, complying with some of the standards have unusual situations at their plants, and these alternative standards to be proposed to the state um, and perhaps put into a groundwater protection plan or written into an SPRP might be a potential solution as problems develop. Section 25 of the Act allows the Secretary to propose by rulemaking um, additional categories of tanks for which some or all of the requirements of, of the Above Ground Storage Tank Act can be waived if the contents of the tank don't present a substantial threat or there are some other standards that are cons uh, consistently protective. Uh, so, for example, if SPCC was sufficient and you wanted to say all tanks regulated under the SBCC plan will be relieved of certain requirements of the AST Act, that is something the DEP could do. Um, here again, this is something you might want to raise with your association um, environmental committee chairman to s see whether there are any categories of tanks that might be proposed to the DEP for rulemaking. Now rulemaking is a year-long process and it is something that would have to get started pretty soon in order to go through the rulemaking process and be considered by the legislature next year. Nevertheless, it's something to keep in mind as a potential safety valve for some types of tanks that just don't, you know, don't have any, don't, don't pose any particular threat to the environment. One other category I don't have a slide for, but that has been of, of some issue has been process vessels. The definition of process vessels was changed in the second iteration of the Act to include not just those um, containers or tanks that have biological, physical, or chemical changes going on, uh, but also anything that is part of the production process, even just a holding tank that's a wide space in the line in between uh, as part of the production process. So that expanded the definition or clarified the definition of what a process vessel is. Um, it's our understanding that the DEP has in some cases asked for justifications for why tanks are considered process vessels and not storage tanks. Um, you may want to refer to the definition of process vessel in the Act as support for your decision to exclude uh, certain tanks from registration. With that, um, we've tried to keep it to a half hour to respect your lunchtime. We'd be happy to answer more questions or we'd be happy to hear um, uh, stories or uh, any kind of information from you about, about tanks you'd like to share with, with the rest of the people here on the call today. Yes, my question is around the underground lines that may be a part of a secondary containment. The Act and the DEP has stated that if you are going to use underground lines, that may be a part of your secondary containment, that you need to demonstrate that those lines are impervious and not leaking. Is anyone having to do that? I have heard exactly what you have heard. Um, my understanding from some folks who had received that information from the DEP was that they had gone to talk with the DEP and that there was 
some relief being proposed as to what you'd have to demonstrate. It wouldn't require the the uh, visual inspection of those lines, but you might have to do some kind of demonstration that there there wasn't leaking. And I'm afraid that's as helpful as I can be on that. I do not know about the details of whatever kind of inspection was was required. Okay, thank I don't you. Know. I mean, what part? I mean, I think part of one of the ways to minimize your regulatory exposure is if you can put a uh, first po point of first first point of isolation right on the tag. Is that not going to get you some relief? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're you're saying your secondary containment is a drain to another location with an underground pipe. Yes, that's correct. What we understood originally was the idea that, that there were, the DEP was going to require some kind of pressure testing, which would not be appropriate for some of those drain lines um, in the same fashion that it would be for an underground storage tank. Whether there is some alternative that the DEP is considering allowing, I don't know. Um, do we need any pre-approval before commencing the removal of a 100-barrel tank from a well site to our yard? Is any type of testing or sampling needed before moving the tank? If the soil is sampled, must those be submitted to the DEP or just retained? It's our understanding that um, there's not a prior approval ne necessary to move a tank to another location um, and that the soil sampling could occur afterwards and be submitted to the DEP uh, showing that there was no contamination. It's really a after the tank is gone, it really becomes about the site or the facility and uh, some demonstration that there's not been contamination is what the DEP is looking for. I think you'll need to work with the DEP on precisely what parameters you should test uh, in, the, in the soil based upon what the contents of your tank. One of the examples that was given to us was if you've got a, a brine tank, then looking for chlorides would be the most reasonable thing as kind of a trace to just determine if there was any release at all. And then if there were sufficiently high chlorides, you might decide to go look for some other substances. Yeah, even note, even to the point of noting that um, you know, land application of, of brine is acceptable up to a certain level. So if you're even below that level, you're probably uh, not going to be looking at additional action. But again, you know, it was a, it was emphasized more than once. This is a case by case basis that they want to evaluate. So there still needs to be some communication with the uh, DEP uh, above ground storage tank unit, as far as I know. It. We have another question. If a tank is RL status, can you remove it from the site with no sampling or closure? Register and label only tanks are not subject to um, the regulations uh, with some limited exceptions. So uh, no sampling would be required uh, outside of the regulated tank category. Okay. 